Good evening, everyone. This is a special call meeting. Um, I will call roll. Won't take long here. Um, Kristen Parker, Betty Kinsey's president, Natasha Hopkins, Michael Fulbright, David Moore, Nathan Atkinson, Will Sims, Here. Denny Beaver, Here. Chad Howell, Here. Donna Marinci, and Tommy Here. Dudley. We do have a quorum, so we will move on. I'm going to, to take the chair's license here, I guess, where you can have it if you want it, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to move up. We added at the la uh, uh, 24 hours ago two things that really were supposed to be come up at the uh, regular meeting and somehow they didn't make it on the agenda, but they are important things that we just need to, to vote on this evening. But I'm going to move them forward because I think the, the subject tonight is the budget. So uh, first it is the review and suspension of, of board policy 3.206. Mr. Perryman. Yes, ma'am. On May, May 3rd or 4th at our May meeting, you guys suspended that policy, and that is the policy that governs uh, community use of our facilities. We have shut down all outside groups in any form or fashion since then. We are to the point now, and, and you remember our, our main pushback at that point was if our children couldn't be in our facilities, we didn't feel like outside groups should have access to them. We are opening back up. We actually have students back in the building as far as special needs testing right now. Mr. Pointer is going to talk to you about our athletic plan, which would start on uh, actually Friday because we would be doing physicals on Friday in conjunction with Murray Regional, but actually activities on Monday. So we're at the point at which we're going to enter back into the buildings if you say that's okay. We, we wanted to at least bring the conversation back to you so that we can talk to the groups that use our facilities. We have several churches that hold church in our facilities. We have several outside groups that use them, Boy Scouts, uh, ball teams, different types of things. And we're fielding lots of requests as to when they can start back. And we just wanted to bring this to you, have discussion, and let you give us guidance on how you feel about this, this topic. So I'll turn that over to you. We attached the, the, um, the actual policy that you suspended. You, your motion that you attached to it is motion to approve the suspension. You mean to lift the To approval. lift the suspension, okay. yes, ma'am. All right. Any, is there any discussion? I move we appro uh, approve lifting the suspension of policy 3.206. Is there a second? Mr. Fulbright seconded that motion. Any discussion? The, excuse me, Will. M Mr. Sims. Yeah, I know um, I talked to you about cost of cleaning. Have you reviewed those? Are you still comfortable with the? We did. The, we reviewed okay. a, a by event cleaning, and we have started talking to the churches specifically because they are our biggest group that takes the most space in our buildings. And we do feel that if we charge a 250 flat fee for each cleaning, that working through either company, ABM or SMS, we can clean the, the parts of the building that they use to the COVID standard in that amount of money at the rate at which they charge for their employees. So we are comfortable with that, with that number. Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Ms. Marinci. Um, I just want to clarify, all of these um, groups have insurance and there's no liability for the school district with? No, ma'am, they all have liability insurance. That's part of being able to use it. And right. we are listed on their policy uh, along with them, but they do assume liability when they come back into the building. Our only liability would be if we did not adequately follow up with our cleaning, uh, and we'll make sure that we do that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Howe. Um, and so the flat 250 fee, that's whether they use one room or the whole school. That's, that's the only way we know to do it right now is just have a flat fee uh, that's on there. We can look at adjusting that. One of the things I am concerned about is we do give principals uh, a, a way to waive fees, and we're really good at waiving fees. Right. I'm uh, familiar lots with that, of people yeah. know lots of people who say, oh, yeah, you can come for We're not in a place right now where we can waive a fee. Right. Uh, we have to come in. We can look at adjusting on a smaller scale, uh, but right now we felt that that's a, a pretty firm number. And I, and I mentioned to Mr. Sims the other night, we had a an event last week with military graduation that was only about two hours long. We were in the building about four to five hours. But because of the number of people, 
we don't know where they sit. We had to clean the entire auditorium. So when they come in, we're going to do a room, we're going to do restrooms, we have to do common areas, doorknobs, and we just felt that the flat fee may be the best way to go through that. I understand. My only my concern is just, you know, for a church to, to, to do that, that's not an issue. That That's just the cost of doing business there. They, they, they understand that. But for a uh, scouting organization, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, I'm a, I'm a big scouting supporter, you're locking them out. They're yeah. not going to be able to afford that. So I, that's my only concern. I, and I'm not saying don't charge. I, right. I fully agree. I just want to make sure that. I and, mean, and if you wish for us to, we can look at something like that. Uh, specifically some groups like that that we historically have data on where they are the unfortunate thing sometimes is those groups enter into our largest spaces they'll come to a class but they also go to the gym right um, and, and that's where you really get into that that big amount of cleaning that because you have to clean the whole thing you, right. you don't get to clean just a little bit of where you think they were uh, and we would hope that as we move forward as, you know, if things settle and as times maybe go back to more like they were, that this is something that we can just shed and, and, and not even have to do again. And I understand with the uncertainty of it, we can't say, you know, we're going to have a moratorium on it at in December. Right. Uh, I, you know, it's going to be depending on the situation. Um, but I would like this to be very mindful of the situation and where we are and that we can remove that as soon as we can. Would it be appropriate if we have a situation to where we feel that it's appropriate to waive that flat fee when we bring these, these to you and you know we bring every month to you facility uses that we will make a note in there that we made we changed that we made an exception and give you the reasoning why uh, if that's not okay we can stick to the flat fee uh, I just wanted to not get into the situation to where we were waiving things and like I said we're really good at waiving things uh, and for the short term, at least, until we're back and we know what everything looks like, we, we needed to do something. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. I, I, I don't want to get into a situation where we're making exceptions for this and that and this and that. I, that just, that doesn't, that we can't do that. But just as long as we're aware that there's a situation that we need to keep this on the front burner right. and be aware that I, I don't want to limit the use of these facilities to the public and we're only I mean, right now saying the cleaning fee for inside use so if the if the boy scouts if the girl scouts wanted to use one of our outside facilities and we have outdoor class we can make that happen it may not be where they normally have been but we're not going to charge you to disinfect the ball field or something like that we just can't do it right so so inside use right now would be the only thing that we would look at that fee for thank you is there any other discussion uh, just noting that Ms. Parker and Ms. Hopkins um, are here and present, and I moved up the two uh, add-ons there first so that we can spend more time on budget uh, after that. And there's a motion on the floor. With no discussion, then we're ready to vote. Not on my screen up here, Charlotte. You have to tell me. Okay. So that motion does pass. Uh, next is the athletic plan. Uh, Mr. Pointer. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to add the athletic plan on as either an FYI or just in the event that you may have some questions. We will be resuming athletics beginning, as he mentioned, on Friday, um, as we will be conducting physicals at Columbia Central High School. Um, um, and then practices, training, tryouts, all of that will begin uh, starting on Monday across the district in our high schools only. Uh, then we will be bringing our middle schools online after the TSSAA dead period. So this is an FYI. We don't have to vote on this. You just wanted us to know the plan. Yes. So it, there's no approval necessary, just an FYI. I, I would know the proper procedure or protocol if y'all needed to approve it or well, not, but it's here for you all to. Definitely, if, if there are any questions. And Ms. Kinzer, that was the main thing. We wanted to make yeah, sure you absolutely. had seen it and had the, the opportunity to vet it before us, before we actually entered back in. Okay, seeing no lights, thank you very much. Uh -huh, thank you. Okay, moving on now, it's ready for the... Oh, the discussion of the budget and 
and you know there are several attachments there. The mouse is not getting me to budget. Okay. Um, and what I'd like to do, Mr. Laconan, if this is okay, is let's go through starting with the capital worksheet because we're actually going to have to to vote on some of these separately. So uh, let, let's do it that way, okay? That well, sounds good. All right. So um, you have the capital worksheet before you. This is this is the capital request that I, I was submitted from uh, the executive team and. You can see what those projects are. Eric Perriman is here to answer any questions. And this is what, if we approved something tonight, that is what would go forward to the Financial Management Board tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. And then they would forward it to the Budget Committee on that same night. So um, that's all I have on capital. All right, is there any discussion? Uh, then do, do I hear a motion? To approve? Wait a minute. Are, uh -huh, we, are we still sure that the numbers for the McDowell and Spring Hill High School are valid? We, we talked to Mr. Spencer, and, and he thinks if we take pretty quick action, uh, they are. If this was delayed and we bring this back up, say, at Christmas or into the springtime, then no, they're not. But right now, uh, they would be the valid numbers that we were given and that we think is appropriate. And, and I will tell you, Mr. Mr. Luconan, through conversation, did ask me to kind of prioritize the things on this list. There were two things that I pointed out that I think we, we really, really have to have. One, obviously, is the buses because we lose them out of the rotation and we have to, um, we have to replace them by, by law as we lose them. The second thing is the Santa Fe um, Unit School uh, HVAC renovation, it is a complete renovation. It is like we did at Withorn, where we have to shut the building down for two to three months, and it is very invasive. Um, we have a system down there that we are limping along. The earliest, if this went through and was approved this capital year, we could do it would be next summer. If it is delayed, it'll be two years out, and we do not think the system will make it two years. So. The two things that I prioritized for him out of the lower issues, not talking about McDowell, not talking about uh, Spring Hill High School, is that sh that's you guys to talk about, were the two that we identified were Santa Fe and the buses. Mr. Sam. Okay. Can we entertain a motion to approve if there's no discussion? I so move. Is there a second? Mr. Beaver seconds their discussion. Then we're ready to vote. Oh, excuse me. I, I, I looked down there and didn't see it. Sorry, I delayed it. Um, I will just say I will probably be voting against this. I think with what we're facing, I don't know that asking for $93 million in capital outlay is a reasonable request for us to make of the commission. Um, I would be much more... Um, inclined to vote for something along what Mr. Perryman said. I think we need to look at what our absolute needs are as opposed to maybe what, and I'll, I'll, I think there's things that are also limping along too, but I don't know that we have any chance of getting $67 million for replacement or additions of schools, so I'd rather not poke that bear. I think the way I feel about that, because I have been going to financial management, going to commission meetings, and commissioners saying, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? And I reminded them that for three years we've asked for money for Spring Hill and for uh, McDowell uh, that they didn't approve. And then we asked the community to raise taxes that with the idea that that was going to help us to get that new school for McDowell that needed school and, and help with Spring Hill. And I'm, I understand the situation we're in, but I don't want a commissioner to come to me and say that I didn't ask. Uh, I understand, I don't think they'll be able to fund it. I'm sure Doug will sit there and go, who knows, but uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to tell the community or tell those schools that we didn't ask for it, because we did, and we have. This would be the fourth time. 
Uh, so I don't think it's up to us to say no. I, I think it's up to the, the people that fund it to say no. But that's just me. Any other discussion? Yeah. Mr. Fulbright. Doug, we're not able to submit a lower capital outlay request and move those pennies into the general budget without raising the maintenance of effort. Is that correct? That's correct. Other than good faith, what would be the benefit of cutting some things off this list? It gives the Financial Management Board and Budget Committee a clear idea of what you would, what you desperately need versus, it saves them time, uh, but, but um, because they know that they've got $3.4 million to f spend in that fund, and they're thinking of even cutting uh, the, the $2 million that's in there that's already funded because they got a local gov grant for 1.2 million. So money is sparse in that fund and really the big projects, they're gonna have to be done with a borrowing and at this point in time, I, I don't see how we could, we don't have the capacity to borrow for the projects. Uh, so we they would have to ask for a property tax increase during a pandemic and I don't know that they would do that. So I'll leave that up to their decision making process. So there's 3.4 million available in this account for this account. In the 189 fund. Other than that, you've got to borrow money. And we're asking for 93 million 886 thousand and thirty dollars. It's a little bit of a gap. <laughs> um, so we're not. We're probably realistically not getting anything other than the buses and the air conditioning unit. And it may not even be money for their conditioning unit. Um, I I don't see any point in even voting on this, really, the way it is. Um, and and we did not submit this to you as th this is your a la carte menu. The, mm -hmm. These are the things that this list goes all the way back to February that we know have to be done, um, and and. It wasn't submitted as a, a, a total. It, it's just line item by line item, what, what's there and what we know is pretty outstanding or going to be on our near horizon. Okay. I do have one last question just popped in my head. We are not receiving the local, uh, the local portion of that, the funding from the Spring Hill sales tax. Is that correct? That's correct. As of right now, we have not received notification that they've voted that up. I thought we... I, I don't... Yeah. Is our attorney not here? Um, what was that going to go to? If we would have received that money from them, what would that have been? The 151 debt service fund yeah, for school indebtedness towards the money we've already borrowed for school capital projects. It, it would have increased uh, the funding in that account at, at this point in time, which is projected to be at a deficit. So that would have addressed borrowing for the addition to Spring Hill High School? It would not have been enough. Yeah. It wouldn't. But have it would enough. have addressed the borrowing that would be needed for Spring Hill High School. That's that's a tough question to ask. I don't I don't think it would be enough revenue to raise. But that that's what it would go it. towards something similar yes, to that. Yes, it would go towards something like that. Okay, yes. then I then I'm definitely not voting for any capital request that has that in it. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Mary C. Um. I think this whole board knows that we're not going to get this money. I think we're well aware of it. But I also know that we've had commissioners come before this board and accuse us of not caring about kids because we weren't building schools and doing that type of thing. Um, and change in a Spring Hill High School, exact, you know, uh, to be um, exact. Um, I think that I'm going to vote for this simply because knowing that we're not going to get it, but simply because I think I agree with uh, Ms. Kinder. I think that the, um, the commission and those people that have accused us of not asking for it, not caring about kids, and um, let them make the decision that we're not going to do it. Yeah, I agree with y'all. Uh, this is this is projects that need to be done in the future and we need the funding for it it's not our place to say no on it 
it's our place to, to send to the commission to ask for it and let them say no if they can't afford it. Uh, like I said, we're probably not going to get it, but it's, it's our responsibility to ask for the money for the projects we need to fund for our students. Any other discussion? All right, then we're ready to vote. I don't see the vote, Charlie. You'll have to tell me what it is. There was? I'm looking at five yeas or there's six yeas. Five yeas. So that motion does not pass. Well, I'm, I'm seeing just five and I said five and she said one, two, three, four, five yeas. Oh, there it is. Six. At the top it is six. That motion does pass. Excuse me. Um, all right, now I don't know exactly if you'd like to do, uh, get into the, the GP budget or if you'd like to take care of the food service budget before we get into that. Uh, since it's a separate vote, I think food service would, would make sense. They have their, their own funding okay. um, and they've presented a budget with, with only the mandated step increases in there. Okay, all right. Any discussion about it? I know it. he's back there six feet away. <laughs> is there? And it is just simply the step increases in salary. It's the same thing that you received last year. Okay. All right. Thank you. So is there a motion to approve? Second. Mr. Howell made the motion to approve. Is there a second? Ms. Hopkins seconded the motion. Any discussion? Then we're ready to vote. I know it's 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 showing that the vote. Okay, let's vote again. <laughs> it passed overwhelmingly. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but that motion does pass, right? That's from the one before. Okay. All right, moving on. Okay, now we're gonna. Uh, discuss many of you've got several um, hopefully you've seen the uh, looked at all the worksheets which one Doug you think we really should we look at the proposed cuts from executive okay if I, I, would, pull the, uh, all right. I would pull up the proposed cuts from proposal three um, I think Dr. Marzak uh, and, and I kind of have a, a way to start this off, start okay. discussion. <clears throat> the, at the last budget committee work session, 
I was told to budget the revenue number of maintenance of effort. Uh, I was not given guidance on how to do that. Uh, so I have sent a letter to the budget committee and we'll be going over that tomorrow night. Um, basically saying how much are we funding and how much are, how are we budgeting the revenue for the schools. Now we know that maintenance of effort has been decided on by the budget committee, not by the full commission. So that is what the revenue number is that we're starting with or at least what they've said to budget. So th that starting revenue number at the top of proposed cuts uh, on proposal three is that 103,994,821. That's last year's revenue number plus BEP uh, growth on our most recent estimate that we've had. So um, th that, that assumes that we're there. And then on this document, you can see cuts that the executive team made um, in, the, in this past uh, time that we've had. And to get that budget balanced, to be able to have a budget funded level at the same as last year, but does include step increases. Um, if revenue does come in better and we can see it performing better, then we can make amendments as we go along and increase those things. Uh, what you have below the balanced budget line item is the cost required to go with the department head request of textbooks. That department head request was $1,500,000. But in last year's budget, after we had done the 1% increase, we kind of lowered some things. And we've got uh, to get that back to that 1.5 million. That's the cost it'll make. And so there are uh, cuts that, that could be made uh, that the executive team really didn't make a decision on, but wanted you to have an option to at least see. And um, I'm, I would like to answer any questions about any of the attachments, but I would also, before we do that, hand it off to Dr. Marzak. Madam Chair. Okay, so uh, board, we bring to you a balanced budget that only cuts out positions, um, well, actually a majority of positions that are unfilled at this point. Uh, we do have some additional positions that we're recommending to be dissolved into others, but today we did a little extra work. We found some, found some extra savings by looking at some of the benefit options of those unfilled positions that we would look to dissolve from the district. So we're able uh, to add the homebound teacher back into the budget. So we're allowed to keep that as opposed to dissolving that into another position. So um, we bring to United Balanced Budget that um, really doesn't make a major impact on any currently, empl currently employed uh, personnel. What I would recommend to the board uh, considering that we're not sure where we sit with revenue and what's not going to happen, what we we're, what we're sure not, is not going to happen with concerns to sales tax revenue coming in and, and more money coming in, is wait till the books close, see where we are with our current budget that rolls over in, and in order to protect employees and protect their medical benefits, because we're not sure what's going to happen, uh, the board potentially in the early fall looking at uh, using fund balance to fund textbooks for the 2021 year. Which is essentially what we did last year. Once you once we've closed the books and we had money and we put the money back in that we'd taken out, but there's how much money is still in this? What was the figure from last year that was in there? Three hundred and sixteen thousand approximately. Okay, and then we put another about five hundred thousand back. Yeah, yeah, I, seven four, yeah, yeah, I thought seven. it was seven hundred and fifty. Was that correct? Four hundred. Yeah, it was four something, I believe. So, uh, so anyway. So all that below the line is to let us know that that's how potentially that could be funded. But you're saying that, that if we have some fund balance after we close the books, then we can decide, like last year, to use it for those things. That and I would also uh, keep an eye on your revenues and, and see how they're performing, because if they're, they're performing better and, and we are actually not in as bad of a situation as projected, then we can make budget amendments along the way. The Comptroller's Office and Office State of State and Local Finance has, has given us that um, advice. Uh, on the flip side of that, I know that we currently have a meeting tomorrow to go over CARES Act and, and what it can fund. You know, something that it, that it could help with is, is distance learning and, and part of that plan. And um, I would assume that there are some things that we could purchase through that to encourage uh, distance learning, maybe uh, online textbooks. I don't know. I'm going to leave that up to the instruction team. But there is funding there that we might have to be creative with how we how we spend the approximate 1.9 million dollars that we'll get from that. All right. Well, first of all, I I would hope we'd be able to put textbooks 
back from used fund balance for that, but I would not be in favor of cutting any AP positions. Those, that's a, a, an integral part of the school. It's needed, and yes, they are not paid by BEP funds. That's <coughs> correct. Uh, there are a lot of positions. I think we have how many employees? 1,800? 1,600? Probably one out of five employees is not paid by BEP. <coughs> That's just the way it is. It's a formula. I, I printed off the last copy I got of it as well. But that doesn't mean they're not needed, and that doesn't mean that they're not important to those schools. And so I, I would certainly not like to see that happen at all. And I don't understand what the health savings proposal is. I've already had people texting me and wanting to know and what the highlights are, and I don't, I don't know what that is. So tell us about that. So this, this isn't a cut that the executive uh, committee had really offered as this, this is something you should do as a school board. This is an option, like we said, that could be used if you decided to fund textbooks rather than that. And all of the health insurance plans that we currently have would still be offered. There would just have to be a, a reduction of, if you're in that very top tier, the premier PPO plan, maybe uh, we fund a certain amount of that, but you pay a little bit in to have that plan. But we are in, in dire straits as, as far as it goes with, with revenue and, and with the pandemic going on. But like I said, it, it was a suggestion. Uh, we, were, we were asked to cut, and so what did that look like? We're looking at cutting positions. You know, let, let's look at what it might look like if we cut benefits. The truth is, is the state raised the cost of our insurance 2% for, for a full year. That increased our cost. Uh, we're actually, if we pass the budget right now, we'd technically be, we wouldn't have enough money to, to pay all those benefits. We'd be a short a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, and, and so um, to be creative with that, there are plans still, three full plans that would be funded 100%, uh, including the standard PPO, limited PPO, and the HSA plans. Um, but we were just I was just trying to be creative when, when asked uh, to do that, to, to give an option uh, that the board could decide on if things got tough. So um, it, it's just on there for informational purposes. Uh, the sheet does show how many employees are in each type of plan. Uh, the majority of our employees are, are in that standard PPO open access plan, 38%. Uh, and um, you can also see the cost of every one of those individual plans and how much we pay per year. Um, th there are, are cuts that you can, can decide on as a board, and so I'd rather you see it and make your own decisions rather than never get to see it. So. I don't know who's like with, but Mr. Sims. How much money are we planning to allocate toward curriculum with this budget? It would be about one and a half million. So, in the in in this number, um, I mean, in the one one hundred three nine ninety four, we have one and a half million in that to put toward cur curriculum. Um, can you tell what what curriculum you would plan on? implementing and how and it, I guess the time frame on when we would have those that curriculum yes sir for grades K through 5 we uh, adopted McGraw Hills wonders and for grades uh, 6 through 12 we adopted Pearson's my perspective for ELA uh, a couple of months ago I gave you guys a textbook recovery plan which gave you an idea of where we were the last time we purchased ELA books, it was uh, 2009, so it's been quite a while. And it was a partial purchase. Uh, I think they par purchased uh, K-5, uh, part of K-5, and then the next year, and that was about a $500,000 purchase. And then the next year, in 2010-11 school year, they spent about $1.5 million to purchase to outfit the rest of the grade levels. So we thought the best thing to do is just try to outfit K-12. It's a one-time purchase, and then it's done for six years, and then we can begin to catch up. Um, in accordance to the plan that I had uh, given you all uh, and looking what we need to purchase next and thinking about what would be next, uh, we've got to get to um, um, foreign language. That's a concern. Our foreign language books are, are badly out of date. 
And then, of course, we also want to make sure that we get to uh, um, social studies and fulfill that K-8, and then also <coughs> biology. And then, of course, when we get to 2022, it'll be time to adopt math again. So the new math adoption will be up in 2022. So we've got about two years left uh, with the current uh, with math as is. We're set for this year, which is a great thing because of the uh, fund balance money that you gave us. We're set. Uh, we purchased uh, ready math. And so K-8, we're, we're set for math. And then we're also set for math. We, we purchased Carnegie, Carnegie, so uh, we're set for high school. So we have Algebra 1, Algebra 2. And then, of course, we're set with regards to uh, K-8 with uh, ready math. So math is taken care of this year across the board. We're good. And if we take care of ELA, then those two subjects are done. Then we catch up with social studies and science and foreign language next. So the 1.183 1 would be to fill in the remainder of the textbook schedule in your plan. Is that correct? I'm going to defer to Doug on that one. So the, the 1 million, 1 1.183 is just the difference between currently what's funded for textbooks right now, which is about 316000 and the $1.5 million that Dr. Woodard asked for right. in his textbooks line item under the, the department head request. Okay. Well, that, that's what I was asking. So only 300000 of the one one and a half is in the balance is in, budget. Is in the balance budget. That's correct. Okay. That's. That's that's where I was worried because I don't I'm not going to be able to support a budget again without curriculum um, since I've been on the board which is not that long but and even before I was on the board we've had this struggle this battle I don't I think it's time that we figure out where it comes from I'm not saying I know where it comes from but I can't support it without curriculum once again Mr. Fulbright thank you Could, uh, you may have just answered this and if you did just tell me to go back and watch the video what does the 1.83 million get us comprehensively I know it's everything you asked for, textbooks-wise. Is that the list that you just read down? Okay, then I, I do remember what you said for that one. Then I'm like I'm like Mr. Sims. I I want to see that fully funded, and if we have something else we can take out temporarily and fund with fund balance next year, we should do that. It's just too risky for me to say, yeah, we we'll. we'll promise you we'll get textbooks in the fall when fund balance comes in that's that's too chancy I mean we did it and we could easily do it again and probably would but I don't want to take that that chance I want to end the budget what would it look like or what would it and I do appreciate the work y'all did on this 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 makes me really optimistic that we're going to get close to something what would it do to your request if we just lopped off that shortage of 168 562 that would leave you that line request for an additional million hundred and fifteen thousand. Would that make a difference? Or would a million dollars make a difference? <laughs> That's kind of a silly question, but what would it do and what kind of difference would that make? What would you lose if we just cut out that deficit? You know, the more we have, the, the, the more we can, you know, we're not trying to buy the Cadillac version of these resources, um, you know, but what we want, is, you know, we want the textbooks and then we also want the electronic resources. I mean, to outfit everything, you're really looking at about 2.1, to be honest, if, if we're going to outfit everything with electronic resources and uh, the books. But just the books alone, um, you know, one and a half, you know, gets us there. If we start to go lower, then we start looking at, you know, partial fulfillments, maybe going K-8 or just going 9-12 or just going K-4, you know, you can always piecemeal it that way and, and then uh, as things improve, work on getting the other grade levels. That is how it had been done in Murray County in the past, is that they decided to uh, take care of, of like a, you know, K-6 or K-4 and then fill in the other grade levels. So that's always an option if, if the board wants to move in this direction. What we had recommended um, quite a while ago was that we just take, um, you know, just go all in, do a one-time purchase, 
and uh, go one and a half million and, and get it done, and then it's done again for six years. We we'll have to think about it, and then we'll be on our way to catching up because math is set. Okay. Yes, sir. Then that's that's what I want to see us do. I guess my question, I don't know if this is for the board, for the staff, for Doug, anybody else that wants to answer it. What could we take out and then fund with fund balance after we know that number in the fall or whenever instead of the textbook? I don't even know who to ask that question to, but that's my question. Because I don't want textbooks to, to be removed from this budget in any way. It, could it be things that could be wait to be funded, like some maintenance or, I mean, that we, would, that we put it back in so that we could go ahead and order these textbooks so they'll be here? Can we delay some of that? Yeah, I, you're both looking at me like, oh, my gosh. If, if they they say what they could do without, I can change the numbers as we go. Um, but it, I would defer to them on what they need for their departments. And I'm going to go to the bathroom. Oh. <laughs> he, he's going to abandon me. Yeah. I, that's that's it, yeah. It, with it, that, your best option is the operations, um, because because you know as you know fund balance is one time money. It's not reoccurring. Right. Once it's spent, it's gone. Um, so it would it would pretty much be in operations, everything in instruction. Is, is pretty much reoccurring funding. Uh, that's that's big buckets, big buckets of money. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty much up to Eric. So so yeah, pretty much up to Eric. You know, and, and I will <laughs> I will remind you, Eric's total six departments are eighteen million dollars. Yeah. We are to two things, people, or utilities. The problem with utilities is we know we're going to buy six hundred plus thousand dollars of diesel fuel next year. If you cut it and revenues don't come in, we're still going to buy $600,000 plus worth of diesel fuel next year. Mm -hmm. um, where the money comes from, hopefully it's there. We think it'll be there. We think it'll be in fund balance. We hope it'll be. I'm giving you close to a half a million dollars in utility funds this, this year at the end of the year. So, so those funds are there. Um, water and sewer, natural gas, electricity, and diesel fuel. Are, are the four places that I know there is money, there's big chunks of money that are not people. If you go into any other areas, it really gets into people or it gets into things that are mandated. We have to do sprinkler repairs. We have to do tests. We have to do, so the things that I would bring back to you are things that when it comes back to you, it's coming back because we have to do it. But um, those are my four big areas outside of people are, are natural gas, electricity, water, sewer, and, and diesel fuel. Ms. Parker. Um, before we get too deep into this, um, can someone explain what exactly is in each of y'all's cuts, just so we have an idea of what, what, we're, what we're losing with that? So in my 351 that I cut, I went into diesel fuel, natural gas, water, sewer, and electricity. Uh, I did have a couple of natural reductions. Um, obviously, we had a change in supervisor at the transportation level. That's a lesser salary than the one that was there before. So there are some small cuts. They're, they're, they're four to $5,000 cuts. They're small cuts. Um, that's where I got my, my the 99% of that 351 were out of those line items there. Thanks, Eric. So, Ms. Parker, to answer your question, you know, I was on vacation and I got this wonderful email saying cut 5% more out of your budget. So, uh, I came back to a nice surprise. So, here's what that looks like on the instruction side. Uh, two clerk positions, and these are positions that would, one is a non-renewal, one is a retirement. So, as opposed to replacing those positions, we'll just have to function uh, without those positions. It would be... Um, uh, five teaching positions and uh, looking at ratios and again this is not without fully implementing the right sizing model but just looking at positions that we could replace in schools get some savings back and then uh, keep schools under the ratios then we had some positions that we could uh, do without there uh, and again that's keeping schools under the ratios then we looked at some of our CTE programs there were two positions in CTE that we could uh, two vacancies that we chose not to replace then there was um, some equipment lines, we cut about 7,000 out of equipment. Uh, we looked at our, our homebound program. 
And so we, we have two homebound teachers. One serves as more of a lead, and the other is actually out in the field in those homes and assisting students who have real serious medical issues. And we looked at maybe uh, shifting some responsibilities and potentially cutting that at a cost of about 55000 Okay. I'm just, yeah. Okay. Uh, we also looked at uh, travel. Uh, we cut travel by 5,000 uh, to reduce that from 33,000 to 28,000. But that is uh, what pays for all of the employees that travel across the county that go from here and there and that use the personal vehicles. Um, we made a cut there. Uh, we cut and reduced other contracted services. There's some things that we won't have to have back this year that gave us some savings. So we cut 25,000 there. So we only have about 25,000 in that line, and the bulk of that will be going towards mental health. When we have students who have to be placed in residential facilities for mental health, uh, we pay those bills out of that line. And as you all know, our mental health uh, situations are increasing. And we never can tell what they look like from year to year, but they're running 15 to 20,000. So we have 25 in there just to be comfortable. Uh, we reduced the other charges line by 5,000. Uh, we also uh, eliminated the uh, part-time data coordinator position. That was a $45,000 elimination. So uh, by the time you look at what we saved um, just in, in positions, uh, it came out to about 561000 That's just before we added benefits. So with benefits to those positions, uh, it will be a, a savings of $621,272. So it's, um, it was a lot, and we really were thoughtful about this, and, and uh, we really decided to... Um, um, look at it deeply and, and we made some some cuts and again we did this with positions that were uh, vacant so that people were not impacted by this so these are just vacant positions that we're not going to fill and again uh, it just means that um, though we're taking those positions away those schools are still under their ratios can can I revisit and say sure. two things and then I'll, I'll get out of y'all's way and let y'all talk um, the, the first thing is our bond money from our two EMG uh, bonds together is sitting at about $600,000. Um, I will have fund balance request of you next year that in the last three to four years we've paid out of EMG money. It's not there. We've dipped into the McDowell money because we had to. We know that with McDowell operating this upcoming year, we're going to come ask you for 200000 next month just to get it going and keep it operating for as long as you want it to. So. so I know that there will be fund balance requests because we're going to have things that break. And you guys know that sometimes they're small things and sometimes they are, they are big, big items that come in. We have a fire suppression systems, you know, that's a couple hundred thousand. And HVAC can be anywhere from 25 to, to a million dollars real quick. So, so just keep that in mind. And, and that's really the, the other thing really floats off of that. I'm not opposed to you, you coming in into my world, I will remind you it's only $18 million total. Um, so it's not a big chunk of everything. But those four categories are really the only places we can sustain much cut without me sending folks home. Uh, and those are the folks that you can't absorb by sending several other, you know, you can't send more kids into, into a maintenance man's classroom. They're covering about on average right now about 70,000 square feet a, a piece and so if we do those things if you get into to those folks they don't one there's not much return because they're, they're pretty cheap compared to, to other folks and two we really get stretched pretty thin so uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you guys but I just wanted you to know there will be things that come back outside of any cuts that you make you still want to I have one more question um, my other question is, um, I think the other night I asked for kind of a, a look at what we get funding for from BEP. And as we know, BEP is basic education. I mean, it's not, it's not fund fund funding the Cadillac version. But just from a basic education standpoint, by my calculation, we should be spending at least a million dollars on textbooks, which we haven't been doing in the past. So we're we're building on previous years of not funding it properly. And then this year we're talking about underfunding it based on this current budget, which I'm not willing to do. I, I don't want to use fund balance for it. To me, if the state says that our minimum that we should be spending is a, min, is, is a million dollars, then we should have a million dollars budgeted in. And I think what Ms. Miller said the last time we talked about ELA was 
that number was actually closer to two million, um, especially when you start looking at the digital components. And if we're talking about doing distance learning with no digital components, I don't know how we're going to operate school. So I, I don't think that this part of the budget addresses the needs for the school system. The other thing that I would say is in looking at that BEP formula, it also talks about um, response, to response to intervention. Is there any money in here for that? All right. <laughs> we did not have any uh, funding for, um, you know, we'd love to have the inter interventionists back. I, I think, you know, we, we saw really good gains when we had those interventionist positions. And that was, uh, I think, 2017. And I think we spent about $800,000 to put those interventionists in schools. I know principals would love to have those back. Mm -hmm. And when we sat down with principals in schools and, and, and asked them what they wanted in their keys budgets, you know, that came up over and over again. But we just don't, you know, we feel like we just don't have the, the funding for it. It's just not there. It's just too tight. Well, and um, let, me, let me say why I'm asking that. Yes, ma'am. Because, again, it's basic education program, right? So it's the basic. What, what, I mean, I'm looking at it. It says minimum one per system. We're not even funding one for the entire system for response to intervention, which is something that I believe kids have to spend how much time in? response to intervention every day in their classes. I mean, it's something that we tell principals, you got to put it in your schedule, but we're not providing any type of support for it, even though based on this formula, we get some money for it. So I go back to, we have got to look at what we're funding. I mean, and, and with all due respect, Ms. Kinzer, you mentioned the APs. I love APs, but if we can't, I mean, we're not getting money for all of them. I mean, when we're talking about spending you know, spending money on a school that doesn't get an AP paid for, doesn't get a gym teacher paid for, doesn't get an art teacher paid for, all these things, like, we're covering it. And our education is not improving for these kids. So at the same time that we talk about, oh, we want smaller schools, we want smaller classes, it's not, it, it's not showing the benefits because we're not getting paid for those smaller schools. And we got to have the support from the local side. And, I mean, right now, I don't know if the local side's going to have it. So I guess my question is, when we were looking at this budget before, it was $99 million was our expectation on sales tax, or, or for the total number. So let's assume that that is closer to what our actual revenue is. Who is going to make up the $4 million? The difference between 99 and 103. The county. They have to. By law. And if they don't have it, how are they going to do it? <laughs> That's their responsibility through maintenance of effort. They have to do it. They don't have a choice. So I sent over the projection, and you guys saw that. that that's what we think, or what I think is going to happen to sales tax. It's my best guess. Every finance director in the state is throwing a best guess based on their region on this. So that's why I sent a letter today to the budget committee to ask them, they told me to budget to give the school district maintenance of effort. So if I'm going to budget for, for sales tax, then I'm going to budget the same way for the county as I am the school district. And so with that said, that shows a decrease. I've even come off that decrease a little bit. I, I went home, I meditated, I prayed. I was thinking 20% was a much better number, which does help uh, our, our situation. but. If, if the county commission has asked me to budget maintenance of effort as that is the revenue they would like to budget for the school district, I sent them a letter and it's attached to the agenda for tomorrow to tell me exactly how. Now, if they, they choose to give me directive to leave sales tax alone, leave, it the same, leave all the revenues the same as it is last year, then we could see a deficit and we have, I've contacted multiple attorneys. Uh, I've contacted Jake. I've can contacted Daniel. I've contacted CTAS and their attorneys. I've contacted the Office of State and Local Finance. I've gotten, I've contacted uh, Tennessee Department of Ed, and I've gotten feedback that says all the commission has to do is budget it. I've gotten feedback that says, well, that's not ethically right. I would agree with that. Um, and they would they would technically have to fund it. Uh, there's attorney general opinions out there, but but the main guidance I've I've continued to get is they meet maintenance of effort when they budget it, and and I can 
propose to them that we budget sales tax across the board the same way, but if they pass a budget and, and they give guidance that this is how they want to allocate maintenance of effort, that then they've basically given direction on what they want that budget to be. Um, so w with that said, I I'm awaiting their answer tomorrow night, but at this point, the only guidance I have from the budget committee is budget maintenance of effort for the school system, which I have, which is the 103,994,821. And uh, I, I guess we're, we're at this meeting assuming that that, that is what we would get and that the commission would honor that and there have been uh, discussions of and and if they go with the guidance that, that i have sent on that letter that's attached to the agenda with that decrease in funding sales tax at the same level for everyone then we have to get creative and figure out how to either come up with property tax or other revenues to make sure that the 103.9 million happens okay What do you, looking at some of this, what what do you do you think we will have some fund balance funds after we close the books? Um, on the the document that I submitted, and, and you can it doesn't let me make yeah. it a little larger. My my original estimate and, and kind of what I'm hanging with is that at the end of this year we will have seven million one hundred and forty four thousand dollars. Now, if we get all the revenue that we're promised. Um, and, and well, well, that that is currently budgeted. Then we would have uh, our three percent test puts us at 3.1 million. So we're actually able to use anything above that to balance our budget at this point in time. So we do have about 3.8 million dollars we could use to balance our budget if we assume that the budget committee allocates property tax or, or other funding sources to make that 100% uh, funded based on the maintenance of effort. But I, I've gotten contradicting legal advice. I, I've gotten legal advice that says all they have to do is budget it. I've gotten legal advice, well, that's not right. If they say they're going to budget it, they should fulfill it. So I'm between a rock and a hard place. So I said this is, this is what I think is fair, but y'all tell me how you would like to budget it, and, and we'll leave it up to um, okay. kind of conversation to do that. But we do have fund balance that um, we can actually put in our budget, in our submission to the state, if we wanted to um, fund it. Well, I, I would like to see us put back in the 1.183, remove some of his, but pay for it with fund balance. Remove some of whose operation. Uh, the th so out of the three hundred and fifty-three thousand uh, he had in in the cuts on the sheet. But but we would fund it with fund balance. Oh, so okay. The 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 full one point one out of his or. Yeah. I'll I'll let him comment. If it doesn't come in, the lights still turn on. And if the lights don't turn on, we don't go to school. I mean, there's $2.4 million that I'm saying right now we have for electricity. You can take the 1-1 one -one out of it alone, but we know that number is a bogus number when we send it as a budget number. Um, and it has to be, you know, fulfilled at some point. We had 2 5 this year, 2 5 oh 9 in there. We saved a ton of money by shutting down. The 2509 was was taken into consideration that we had the two new schools, uh, and we thought we were going to be right on target. Cutting to 24 is stretching what we probably are going to have to have next year if we go to school all year. Um, I mean, you guys tell me we can we can take it. I would I would suggest those four areas, but we know we're going. Those are the four areas I know we're going to spend that amount of money. So. Mr. Moore. Um, so I, I'll just kind of start with where I've said with the last few budget seasons, um, I'd prefer not to use anything from fund balance, but I am yet again frustrated that we are back to the point where we are chipping away at the edges and nobody wants to talk about cutting staffing. And it's not a pretty conversation. 
and I know nobody wants to have it, but I am disgusted that we are yet again, we're going we're gonna to keep all our jobs, and we're going to keep the teachers in jobs, we're going to send them back to school to have them yell at us again for not having the tools they need to do their jobs, which we do every year. And I don't know why we're doing it again. I mean, I know why, because nobody wants to talk about it. But at some point, guys, we need to talk about this. We are chipping away. We're talking about cutting out half the utilities just to buy textbooks. Is this not rec I mean, does nobody realize this is absurd? Or am I the only one that thinks it is? I mean, come on. We know what these are costs we have to have, and I don't want to put people out of jobs, but that is not why we are here. We are here to educate, and we are chipping away at education to keep jobs. I mean, can someone else please see where we're going? Because I'm disappointed. I was expecting to see a budget come back at closer to $99 million. I know that's unrealistic. I think I'm really hoping that Doug's numbers are super conservative and we are not going to be there. We are going to get additional revenue. I'm hoping that. But we are, I think we're going the wrong way, but we come back with a budget that is still showing a deficit, and we're going to have to fill it with, with fund balance. And I know for, for me, I'm not, that's a non-starter for me, as is we're back to doing exactly what I said, pulling textbooks out. So I, I, I would hope someone else, I, maybe I'm alone on this, maybe I'm the only one that thinks this is crazy that we're doing this, but I feel like we need to at some point have some honest discussions about this and what it really looks like to make a true balanced budget in a, an emergency situation, which is where we are. Mr. Howe. So if I'm looking at everything correct, <coughs> I've done some math myself, and with this budget proposal, realistically we're looking at, I believe it's 100 and Five million if we take out the health savings and the uh, APs and we fund textbooks so we're having a shortage of $167,000 okay um, I understand that uh, Dr. Woodard has cut positions he has cut positions in his budget now there's not they're not people so you know they they're they're they're, they're, they're positions that uh, either through attrition or just not being able to fill those positions. We've cut those positions. Um, I don't want to be in that position where we're cutting teachers that we don't, at this point, know that we're going to need or not need. We will next year. We, we have implemented a system for next year. We, uh, you know, if you want to call it right sizing, or, or it's a staffing formula. We have a staffing formula in place for next year that doesn't help us this year um, so we're a year or two or three behind on that but we moving forward we have some potential savings next year with all that being said do I want to cut assistant principals absolutely not um, but I can't cut textbooks we've done that I think our academics I think I, I, I think it shows that we're not giving raises, and that's a, I think everyone understands that understands why we're not giving raises. So, what are we doing to support our teachers? We've got to buy them textbooks. We've not been sending the full cost to educate our children to the county commission year after year after year. We, by Miss Parker's account, I agree with her. We're, we're, we should be spending 900 to a million dollars a year, and we, we we're not. Well, we didn't spend it last year. We did, but we didn't. You know, we, we showed the commission, uh, we're only going to spend 300000 and then we chose to fund it out of fund balance. So we're not sending the true cost. Um, I, you know, I, I, this is a tough decision. It, it, anytime we do budgeting, it always seems to be a tough decision, and it gets tougher every year, it seems like. I... I'm okay with using fund balance. I'm not. It, it, it's $167,000 if we take out the other things. Um, it's not where I want to be. I, can we get this down lower? I, I can't. I don't know the budget well enough. I don't know the positions well enough. I'd have to rely on staff to that. So unless we're giving directive to staff to say we need an additional number, 3%, 4%, 5%, you know, we're not going to get that from them. We're going to have to give them a directive of how much, a percentage-wise, a, tar a target of where we want to be. So. Mr. 
in the 751,000 that it says for the assistant principal's positions, how many physical people is that? That would be, uh, that would be a cut of, for the 751, it would be uh, all elementary school assistant principals. Um, based on the BEP formula, we do not earn those positions, and the formula has really changed significantly for um, elementary schools. It's, it's really high. We're nowhere near it. In middle school, I think it's now 650 to 1. So, you know, in some of our, in some of our middle schools, we wouldn't earn them there either. So, uh, yeah, things have changed significantly. Was so I'm looking at the BEP. I'm looking at the BEP. Uh, 1920 BP, it says assistant principal elementary, one per 880 to 1099 enrollment. So you earn one at 880. And then for assistant principals at the secondary level, it's one per 650 to 999. And a second one is earned at uh, 1250. Um, so if you want to go that route, um, you know, you could do it. We don't earn those positions, but. Again, I would not recommend that due to the number of evaluations, due to the demands uh, of principals and schools, as Ms. Kinzer spoke to, it would be uh, extremely taxing on our schools to, to, to do that. I would love to see the board, and I just want to put this out here and, and, and speak my heart to you tonight. Um, would love to see the board um, try to make it work and, 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 and take it out of fund balance. It, and again, it's a one-time thing, uh, and we're in, in, in different waters right now. There were a lot of people who've been uh, detrimentally impacted by COVID-19. We have teachers whose husbands lost their jobs, and we have people who have sick family members, et cetera. So it will be a tough time to cut people now. I, I get it. We, we do need to look at our staffing, and we do need to begin trimming the fat. But, boy, this is a tough time to do it. If you have people who've been loyal to this school system, been good, dedicated employees who come in here, and, and we have people who work for, really, they're just working for the insurance. They work for peanuts. We have people who make... Uh, 15, 16,000 annually, and it's really not even enough to feed their families. And then we tell those people, you know, goodbye. One, we didn't get a whole lot of major savings from it, and then two, we heard a lot of people who've been loyal to this school system. So when we cut people, we're cutting people who really care about the kids and about our school system. So it should be entered into extremely lightly. That is why, you know, three years ago I proposed a right-sizing model that makes those cuts in a way that is not so hard. We know in some of our schools we're way overstaffed, but we don't have to grab all of that human capital back at one time. We can implement this model and grab it back a little bit at a time and also look at our attrition and not replace some positions and then not hurt people uh, so badly. And so I think we're in a situation right now where we do need to think about people, think about the people who are hurting right now and uh, what this does to them. Because uh, again, some of these people, have, the spouses have lost their jobs and then if we cut them, they would lose their jobs also and then it hurts some of our children in the county. And if we can go to fund balance and pay for these ELA books and do it one time, um, then we implement the model next year, we'll be closer to where we wanna be. With regard to purchasing ELA, it puts us on, on the track that we talked about with the textbook recovery plan. This was the year that we said that all we need to do was get to ELA, and then in that third year, we'll get to social studies and science. So we would still meet what we said we were gonna do, and we're still on track and we're catching up. And I'm proud of you all for making those tough decisions to do it. It's not easy. But once we get that model in place, it will be a little easier to make these kind of tough decisions because it's tough. It's tough to cut people right now, but that's my take on it. And uh, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Well, I, I was going to okay, do a follow up. Um, in, in making the cuts, was any central office positions looked at being cut? Yes, sir. I, would, I was looking at uh, one homebound position. Uh, the, it was the homebound. The person I mentioned as the lead, uh, that position was um, and looked at. And also we eliminated the uh, data coordinator position. Those duties were shifted to me, and I, I've been handling that for over a year now. We haven't had it. I've been shipped, handling those duties, and, and uh, at this point, we'll just have to roll without it. It would be a luxury at this point. We really need someone to do the assessment piece, but it would be a luxury, and uh, we just spread those duties out. But yes, we did. But I'll be honest with you, we're skeleton crew. I mean, your curriculum and instruction department for 13,000 students here in Murray County is about four people. Um, there are districts that are much smaller to have seven to 12 people, you know, that are operating and 
helping drive instruction. We operate on a skeleton crew, we really do. And if academics is the number one thing, we are the smallest of all the departments that exist in central office. We are the smallest and it would stretch thin. But we did consider uh, central office positions, sir, to answer your question, and we made two cuts there. We're looking at making two cuts. I think we may have added one back due to finding savings with benefits, so it would only be one now. Thank you. Were any other central office positions looked at, Dr. Marzak? No, there's nothing left to cut. This board's cut that out over the last couple of years. To the point of two years ago, I brought back to the board a percentage of what central office comprises the entire budget, and it was less than 7%. Uh, across the across the country, you see anywhere from eight to thirty percent. Anything below seven percent is problematic areas. That's where you start to make mistakes. State forms don't get filed on time. Audits don't get done on time. Uh, grants are not filed for because there's nobody to do the work. So there's really nowhere to cut at the central office level. There's nobody left. Well, I don't know if assistant principals is the place to cut. That was the only option that we had in the proposal. I, I know some assistant principals that do a lot and do, do good jobs. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all, but that's, that's all that we were, we were given. Um, and if that is, the direction we want to go, I may support it. I don't. I don't know yet. It's still. I'm still kind of up in the air. Um, not saying that's where I want to cut, but I think we're gonna. At, we've got to find it somewhere because I, like others, have said, am not prepared to enter another budget without textbooks, and I don't. I don't. Um, want to take it out of fund balance again. Dr. Arzak. Thank you. So, I mean, I, th I think it's safe to say we've limped along for two years. In, in August of 2018, you know, I told the board for that, that budget process, it came down to three things. And I think most of you remember that. It's either going to be people, it's either going to be benefits, or it's going to be student programs. And in August of 2018, we cut student programs to the tune of $3.2 million. We took resources out of the classroom that were digital, we took laptops out, and we cut that in order to keep people and keep benefits. Last year's budget was not much of an increase to put any of those student programs back in. So you are literally left with two options, people or benefits. That's, that's really the only options you have before you. And so when we sat down this week and we brought this, this budget, the key thing we wanted to bring to you with the balanced budget was how can we honor the work that's been done and being, being done in this district by trying to keep as many people as we can employed during this time of pandemic, and we don't know when this is going to turn around. We have no the idea when that's going to happen. As other districts around us are cutting, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, Wilson County, two weeks ago, th three weeks ago, cut 70 people, 70 teachers out of their budget. You know, I told you guys a couple weeks ago, teachers are watching. They're watching to determine which school systems they want to go to by determining who honors whom. So we brought to you tonight a balanced budget that honors the direction this board has taken for the last four years in order to preserve instruction in the classroom. And the recommendation is, once the books close and everything rolls in, you can begin to take some of that additional money, put some of those resources back in the classroom. We're going to have CARES Act money that will be able to add digital curriculum back in that kids will be able to access even if we're not out of school. Eric's going to have operational expenses. Those are going to be there. Buildings don't get better with time. They're not like wine. They get worse the more you use them. So he's going to need money as well. We're going to have to be very fiscally conservative over the course of the next year. I'm sorry, you guys are going to have to be very fiscally <laughs> conservative over the course of this next year. But I think if you do people wrong, you're going to hurt yourself in the long run. And nobody's going to want to work here. Ms. Parker. Is it possible to combine the workload of the APs? For example, at our elementary schools, 
when you have an elementary school that is less than 600, can they share, like, Baker and McDowell or Riverside and Highland, or is it possible for them to share APs and get some funding that way? It's possible, but it's not viable. When I was the principal in Nashville, when the, when the evaluation model rolled out in 2011, I didn't have an AP. So I had a planned, a planned, a planned um, observation. The teacher and I sat down. It was going to happen on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. At 8.45, a kid in a gardener goes off. And so one of two things has to happen. I either violate the, the observational model by taking care of that child, or I stick with the observation model, and my secretaries in the office have to babysit this child until I get done with my observation. While the observation model takes place, the rest of the building is continuing to work and continuing to go on. So can it happen? Yes. Is it a viable model? No. Because things happen during the course of a school where the principal needs to be involved in state-mandated um, activities and operations. But if we're looking at cutting APs, mm -hmm. sharing them is, is a worse model than having none? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I wouldn't say that. What I'm telling you is I wouldn't, I wouldn't entertain the model at all. I, I would keep your APs. And they were put in place for a reason. Right. Your APs were brought in and recommended to be funded by this board when the Tennessee, Tennessee um, Education or Acceleration Model observation process came into play because principals could not do the observations without additional help in their individual buildings. So can it be done? Yes, but I don't recommend that you do it. Well, I think, again, that comes back to looking at how our schools are set up and, and the way that we're – and, I mean, I don't think we can necessarily make that change at the 11th hour. This is the issue we get into every year. But I just have a problem with the answer every year being take it out of fund balance. Take it out of fund balance. And the thing is, y'all tell me, oh, well, we're just going to buy it for textbooks. It, it's, it's not a reoccurring expense. expense. But when, you are when you're overstaffed, and you said we're overstaffed, and we know we're overstaffed, and we're not doing anything about it, that's, not, that's a recurring expense that we're taking out of fund balance. I mean, it depends upon which pot you want to look at or whatever, but that's essentially how we're paying for this stuff, um, for the overstaffing, and that's a problem to me. Um, one other thing, I know, Dr. Marzak, during your administration, we've had summer hours, we've um, allowed central office um, personnel to be off for inclement weather days and flu days and sick days and things like that. If, if we don't need them on those days, can we cut contracts? I mean, can, I mean, if they can get the work done in 11 months as opposed to 12 months, can we cut contracts for some, some central office personnel that um, don't need to work on those particular days? Sure. Yeah, you guys can, you guys can cut that if, if you want to. Sure. Do you know you how much that. savings that would be from no. a summer hours perspective? No. Can you work on getting that? I mean, yeah, we can get it. When do you want it? If that's something the board wants to do, it's, it's being asked by one member. Is, is there a majority that wants to explore that option of cutting contracts and reducing salaries? Salaries pretty much do. I mean, I'm, I think everything at this point has to be on the table if we're trying to get to a certain point. I'm not saying that I'm in love with any of these options, but this is what happens every year. We get to June and we gotta come up with millions of dollars in cuts. And like Mr. Perryman said, there's only so much you can cut on the operational side. Eventually it comes down to instruction. And you're right, we did cut things as far as programs go um, several years ago. But we have recurring expenses with, with personnel that we, we failed to address over and over again. Um, the permanent subs that we added in last year, is that included in this budget? Is that a, an area that we could potentially cut? But if, if you remember, that money was a part of the substitute budget anyway. So what we did is we just earmarked it, but it was part of the sub-budget anyway. So it didn't increase that? No, it didn't okay. increase, no ma'am. And then um, what about district ELA and math coaches? Yeah, those are, yeah, those are title funded. Okay. Um, any portion of our pre-K program that we're yeah not we, we, we fund six positions at a pre-K yeah we can close six pre-K programs I mean again you I, I'm just saying I'm, yes I'm, we can do that I, I appreciate yeah. that Dr. Marzak I'm just saying 
what I asked from you on Monday night was to mm-hmm. tell me what it is that we are funding. Yes. I mean, I don't know what we're funding from Title. I don't know what we're funding from local. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's grant funded. Give us the tools. If you don't like the direction that we're taking, you have to give us the tools. You're not giving us the tools. Giving me a budget and telling me to make several million dollars in cuts, I can't, I can't do it in an educated manner. I'm asking you to educate me. Be a teacher. Mm-hmm. Give me the information. Give me the tools I need. I'm no different than your teachers. Give me that information so that we can make educated decisions up here. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to brainstorm. I know you guys tried to brainstorm. I don't know what these people make. We can't make these decisions in a vacuum. Please just give us some information, some way to get to yes. That's, that's all I'm asking for. Rinty. Um I'm, I'm really concerned about the AP, um, cutting the AP positions. Um, as far as I know, that the assistant principals that I know have worked their way up. They've been, I mean, the way they got to their position is be, they have been great employees. Most of them were great teachers. And to me, it seems like we would be cutting the cream of the crop. Uh, why cut, and my question to you is, why cut up here? If we have to make cuts, let's cut those teachers that are we have you know overstaffed that aren't performing the way we want them to perform why cut the cream of the crop and that's where I'm I would rather see us look at where we can cut if we have to cut positions I would rather us cut positions from not from the the top the cream of the crop I want to I want to make something clear here these these APs are tenured teachers, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. So you're not cutting the position. Their no. job, they would have. We'd have to put them in a, a position. Yes, so and they would displace a currently they uh, would currently displace employed someone teacher. Else. So you, yes. you're actually demoting them. Yes. Okay. So um, first of all, this isn't a typical year. We've had a pandemic. There, there is no way that we can compare this year to any other year. Doug's dealing with loss of revenue and all that, but, but the commission is holding strong on their obligation to fund us to that maintenance of, uh, of effort, which I, I laud them for that. And even though we have the law behind us, that's what it should be. I, I hear you about fund balance. I've heard you about fund balance, but th- we've just been through a pandemic. We are, don't know what this fall is going to look like. We don't know if we'll even be in school or whether we'll be digital or or distance learning or anything. We don't know. But we've got to have a budget, and and we we have got to fund a budget that we can take maintenance of effort to to the board tomorrow night or sometime in the future. I have one other question. Are we not looking at some more BEP money on those positions that we students we have and they're not giving us money for where are we with that yes so um, we are finishing up our schedules Jennifer Morgan is finishing those up we'll know where we are on that we get our check on June 30th that will also figure into the higher ADM in the fall now maintenance of effort especially at the at the state level can only be adjusted based on certain stipulations and one of those is a reduction in student population right so one of the things that, that this board has got to consider and the school district's got to consider moving forward, if parents are scared of sending their children back to school, how can we engage them? Maybe they work through the Murray County Virtual Academy. Maybe we expand it, not 7 through 12, maybe you expand it 4 through 12. And that parents that have elementary school children at home, they can still access the curriculum until they feel comfortable coming in and your ADM is not affected. There's other things you're going to need to consider because some parents are scared to send their children back to school in the fall. Some teachers are scared to come back to work in the fall. You may be facing a shortage of positions this coming, this coming fall. Uh, there, was a, there was a nationwide teacher organization that put out, put out a, a poll or a survey, and I want to say about 45 to 55 percent of the teachers polled nationwide are nervous about coming back. They're either somewhat concerned or very concerned about coming back um, because a lot of our teachers, no offense, are a little older, they're more veteran age, and they're scared of contracting something from, from, from a child 
uh, that may bring something into the classroom. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider. That was one of the reasons of bringing this balanced budget from where we are is this is, at this point, let's maintain and see where we are. This isn't the time to be innovative. This isn't time to be changing. This isn't time to, 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 to mix up the model. This is the time to see where we are. And that's the conversation that we had this past week on Monday. So we would love to mix all of this up and do some different things. But going back to what you said, Chair Kendra, this isn't the time. This is, this is not the time right now. Uh, one other thing. How, I don't think all the lights on. How, how much of this, the, the uh, health benefit, 200, is, is that going to, you're talking about, make me understand, the Cadillac insurance policy we'd have, they'd ultimately have to pay some of that be for the single employee, or is it family, or what is it? It, it, the sing, the actual single employee would have to pay more to be on that plan, but they would be offered two plans 100% for free. But the thing is, is you know, this model had a lot more savings when I first started on it because we didn't have a 2% increase, first of all, which which was helpful. Thank you. Best billions of dollars. Anyways, um, the, the second thing is that this this is the max amount you could save, which means there's a premier PPO plan for the employee only, employee child, employee spouse, employee family. Then there's a standard PPO plan, and that's got the same thing, except it, it also has open access, just like the premier P, PPO plan has open access. And then there's the limited PPO plan, which has the same, and then there's the HSA plan. Just to save that amount of money, you would have to make you'd have to ask employees to pay to be on the standard PPO and the premier PPO plan and you would only get offered the limited PPO and the HSA plan when I first and the, the thing is, is the employees would actually be on whatever plan they're on now until December 31st but they would go through enrollment and they would see these options and th and that's why the, the savings are so little because first of all it's half a year our costs went up two percent and, and quite, quite frankly, uh, the limited PPO plan, I don't, I don't, there's next to nobody on it. So I, I don't think it's realistic. There, there are some other realistic options. You, you fully fund the standard PPO plan through open access. It only saves you about $90,000. Um, but, and so people lose that, that free premier PPO plan. It's just a decision for y'all, but, okay, but honestly, we, the savings, I don't think merit what you would do. Uh, just my, my opinion, so. The 270, 263,000 savings do not, are not meritable? Well, is well what word? I'm saying is for the amount of benefit that the employees would lose, it just, and, and I don't usually give advice on, on well, stuff I'm like not, this because I'm this is y'all thing is, you would go from if you had a premier you're let's just say you're a teacher you have no kids no family on the plan you currently have a premier ppo plan maybe that you're enrolled in uh, the cost to the district is around eight thousand dollars a year and then you would go down to the limited ppo plan if you wanted a free plan still if not so you'd have, have to make pay, up that they'd difference. Have to pay the difference and the limited ppo plan does not have the same deductible yeah. the same copay the same out-of-pocket maximum so you for the amount of money you would save, I think you would lose, you know, employees and, and attraction on open positions. And that's just my opinion, personally. Mr. Fulbright. Thanks. This is just kind of a housekeeping question. Dr. Weird, on the Word document that, that was sent and attached to this, your cuts totaled 516-210? I read, and that's with the home bell teacher included. On, on the proposed cut form from the executive committee, it's 621-272. Doug? So there were um, positions when we were in the meeting that, that we discovered and reached out that we discovered were not on that list. And so that was the part-time data coordinator, the, the 45,000. 
So you'd take your 516 to 11, you'd add the 45,000 for that position, and then there, there are three clerks. Uh, we have a family resource grant. It funds, it, when it was originally initiated, it funded six positions. Uh, now it only funds uh, three positions and it barely funds that. So those three positions that aren't funded by the grant anymore total $60,000, $60,061. And so that's how you get to the 621. Okay, did somebody mention that the homebound instructor had been added back in? And that's due to uh, Dr. Woodard in his original calculation that you have in front of you. None of those numbers include benefits, they just include the salaries. Okay, so, my, so I guess my, that was a long way to my short question. Is the 621-272, does that have the homebound instructor in it or not? As a, as a cut? It originally did, but because we added benefits to the amount of his cuts to those positions, it is no longer in there as a cut under 621-272. Okay, I, my, my brain is just not processing this. If, if I walk into the central office and there's a home school, whatever the homebound coordinator, whatever, the, is the cut still going to be 621? If that person's employed, the cut is still 621. So, and I'm not saying I want to do this, so don't panic. If we were to take that back out, then that gives us 676. Okay. Okay. Plus benefits. All right. That's all I needed. All right. I'm not recommending that, but thank you for that clarity. So if, since we're all just talking right now, I, I would like to see one of two things happen. Either I would like to see what we asked for the other night, which was an actual balanced budget. And I'm not, Dr. Marzak, I'm not sure why we're calling this a balanced budget. It's not. It's a deficit budget. You're asking to pull money out of fund balance. So I don't know. Maybe my terms for balance are incorrect, but I'm not sure how that works. No, this is a balanced budget. There's, there's no money out of fund balance. Yeah, there's no money out of fund balance. Now, if you want to fully fund the textbooks, then you're right, we're at a deficit budget. Okay. My recommendation is not to fund those at this time. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so I'll go back to this then. Yes, textbooks need to be fully funded, and I've said that all along. So what I would like to see, and again, the board is, is up for that, I would like to see a balanced budget that includes fully funding textbooks, as we had discussed. It was a non-starter for me, or I'm just not going to vote for any budget that does that. Um, or you can we can start this at, a, at another meeting and we can bring this down line by line and we can start cutting as board I don't see any I mean we need to get somewhere we can sit here and talk about and complain about it all night long but I would like to see one of those two things and I'd be happy to hear what other board members want to do madam chair yes. can I have that in the form of a motion please uh, I, I would prefer to see the board kind of discuss which one of those why don't um, we take a break okay well do you mind real quick two seconds yes. Because this is similar to what happened two years ago, yes. and there was no motion, and we brought you back those 50 employees, and then the board flipped. Okay. So I'd like I, it in the I, form I'll of a motion I'll, if you I'll don't mind. Chair Cancer, I'll make a motion that okay. I would like to see a balanced budget brought back to us mm -hmm. that fully funds textbooks um, and does not touch fund balance in any way. And I heard a second over here. I believe it's Mr. Sams. Any discussion? At 
No. Uh, uh, Nathan's wanting to know if we want to break on that before we vote on it or. No, I can't do that. The motion's on the floor. No. Is there, while, while we're waiting for her to present, is there a possibility, if this motion passes, that we can take a break and you all, and, and you could discuss it? Well the, well, the only two areas left are people and benefits. So we will, we will have to recess uh, to determine which employees we riff or which benefits we cut for current employees. Those are our only two choices. There's nothing left to there's nothing left to cut. And, and if I could, I'll, we'll use this as a comment period too, if you don't mind, Dr. Marzak, I appreciate that. And to be honest, I'm not asking you to do something I'm not willing to sit up here and do myself, which is why I gave an A or a B on that because I understand it's not an easy decision for you guys to make. It's not an easy decision if we have to do it either. But I think we're at that point where we're going to have to make that decision. Okay. So uh, if you guys can't bring us that, then the next thing I would do is, again, we start going line by line. And as a board, um, it's going to get ugly, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to, for us to do it. I think we're going to have to. Is there any other discussion? All right. Let's be clear. The motion is that they bring back um, a balanced budget that includes the 1.183243 uh, for textbooks. Um, one million one eighty three two forty three. I'm sorry, I, I can't vote for this motion because I think we need to to take care of this tonight. We need to we, we do have to use some fund balance. It's an absolutely different. You can't compare this. I know we go through this every year. I, I, I lay awake at night thinking about it, looking, studying at this. I don't know. I don't know the best way to do it. I don't like it any at all. But I don't want to cut positions, and I don't want to cut benefits. Um, not at this time. Mr. Howe. And Ms. Kinzer, I, I can appreciate that. I understand that. But functionally, if you take the pandemic stuff out of this, we're having the exact same budget discussion we've had for four years. And we're doing the exact same thing. Functionally, the same thing. Is there any, is there any other discussion? Then we're ready to vote. Mr. Beaver can't vote. I'll just vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her your vote. You're screaming. You're screaming. Yeah, I know. I'm you're screaming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think all you like. <laughs> Remember, I'm sitting right here. I'm yes. <laughs> he votes yes. So that motion does pass. All right, when's our next meeting? Oh, well, that's recess. Okay. Sorry. Okay, Ms. Tidwell uh, is going to sit down. <laughs> I'm going to call the meeting back to order. And who's going to talk? All right. Okay, Ms. Kinzer, so we, we talked back, back, back stage. We talked in the kitchen, um, if you would. And um, we, we, we all agree benefits is not a place to go. It wasn't a place to go two years. It's not a, not a place to go tonight. 
So what we talked about is, is currently looking at the vacant positions that are sitting across the secondary level and in both, both uh, FTEs around support and primary and basically being able to balance the budget that way um, by, by pulling those FTEs from the 71-100-116 line and other support lines um, and basically consolidating across the district. Um, we would have to do the research after tonight, but um, some levels would rise. We have a feeling ADM will rise. More kids will come in. We'll have more BEP coming back in the fall um, because the key thing we've got to do is we have to submit compliance reports in the fall to the Department of Ed to make sure that we're within BEP mandated levels, and then we would work to ensure that that happened. Could you say that in English? How many positions are you? Are we're, you we're, looking, we're looking at the district average of roughly about 18 FTE across the entire district. What is FTE? Uh, Full-time positions. Okay. I'm yes. Just Great question. Full-time positions. I could have answered that question <laughs> only because I asked it a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now keep going. So, so what we would do is at the secondary level, we would look at FTE positions. I thought you were talking to me. We're, we would look at FTE positions to where we could, we could dissolve and students could move into existing classes um, in both the primary education and also in the support roles um, in order to capture the $1.183 million in order to fund textbooks at this time. And, of course, naturally, as more students come in, we'll get more BEP money. We could hire more educators. Um, but we have roughly, Schiffer, you said we have about 70 open positions. Yeah, as of today. So that, that roster could be used and could be looked at at just the secondary level only. We wouldn't touch elementary. We're pretty much funded standard at BEP at the elementary level anyway. Not what you asked for, Mr. Philbrock. I just got a couple. Uh, just one question. Does that still include the cut of two sixty three eight and seven fifty one eight? Yes. Yes, we're still looking at the cuts from the instructional line, and we're still looking at the cuts from the operations line. Yes. So the, as well the as the reduction in HR software. Is that still going to though include the health savings proposal cut of two sixty three eight and no. the AP position? So no. Those go back in, and we those still stay. balance it. We don't touch those. Not the right time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. The computer off. Um, can we, Doug, can we, can we pass a budget not knowing exactly what positions by just saying we want to put that back in there and pass a balanced budget? A budget is a changing, fictitious estimate from day to day. <laughs> All right. Then to I'm to make, make a, the budget a reality, you take action. Okay. Well, I'm I'm going to make a motion, and you may may have to help me word it. But I move we accept a a budget of one hundred three nine nine four eight twenty one that includes one point one eight three two forty three for textbooks. Additionally. Okay, Mr. Mr. No, Shirley, 103 994 In addition. What? No. It's not in addition. In, no, it's, it's in the budget, so it's it just right. including. Yeah. yeah. Including. Yes. Okay. Is and Mr. Atkinson, I think you seconded it. Correct. Any discussion, Mr. Fulbright? Did you say these were vacant positions or positions that have people? We have up to 76 vacant positions as of now, and so we would look to tap that vacant position. If not. There are positions that may be moved to other future openings in the district. We would try to riff actual people as few as we possibly can 
but it all depends on where people are in their licensure area. Okay, well, this was just my question. How many people are going to be unemployed as a result of this? We don't know at this time. No more than 18? Well, That's well a good here's, point. My, here's my problem with this. It only took five minutes to go in there and decide to cut potentially 18 people's jobs. But yet we couldn't take the time to see what it would save us to reduce to an 11 month contract or salary or you know whatever. We couldn't take that time. But we sure could take five, five and a half minutes to cut 18 people's jobs. So I think we're rushing this just a little bit to make some of these drastic cuts. Uh, I just, I don't think we've explored all the options. So, I, you know, I don't live it every day, call me naive, but I just think that that's too big of a rush, too big of a uh, thumb in the eye to a certain extent to just be able to say, we're not going to look at these options, but we're going to cut 18 people. So I'm not pointing that at you, I'm pointing it to anybody that wants it. <laughs> but uh, that's my take on it. I feel very uncomfortable with, with that. To that point, that could include reduction to 11 and 10 months. It could. Those are classified as support roles. That is a possibility because what I said is we would look across primary and support roles in order to come up with the 1183243. Thus, maybe not potentially meaning that many positions if you just reduce from 12 months to 11 or 11 months to 10. Yes. Or even 12 to 10. Correct. Okay. Mr. Moore. I was just going to say I would prefer uh, just, I'm, I'm just, I can't support this and for, for, for part the reason that Mr. Fulbright said um, I'm just not comfortable with that we were able to just go pull 18 positions and I would like to see an actual document that I'm going to vote on. Um, I understand that it's a, a imaginary document but I would like to have something that we've looked at that we're able to all as a board look at and, and look at the items that are included in that budget that make up that number. Yeah, I, I agree that it, this was exactly, I guess, what I was looking for as far as cuts. I mean, you know, not fill positions. That 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 is what I was looking for in the previous vote. But I'm I'm with Mr. Moore. I, I would like a a tangible item that we're voting on showing the cuts or showing what positions are not going to be filled versus just saying we're we're not going to because um, I think in the past that may have bit us before um, but yeah I, I, I would I would like a, a, a true document to to be looking at and voting on Ms. Parker I don't disagree with that at all. My question is, when's this hiring freeze going to be done? <laughs> be it definitely is on right now. Okay, so with that being the case, to me, there's this this has to take priority. I mean, I know we're meeting on Monday. Um, uh, we're meeting on Monday. We're meeting on Monday. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like we may need to meet on Friday if we can get this document together. I mean, I'm okay with that. I just, I want this hiring freeze off because a lot of those positions that we just saw that were open are positions that we've got to have and we need to be filling those positions. And the longer Next we week. wait on that, the worse off this is. Now, I, I agree. I don't want to, I don't know that, that I'm ready to approve something abstract right now, um, not knowing the details. Because the devil is always in the details, and we have found that out year after year. Dr. Marzak. Oh. We wouldn't be able to meet before next week. There are numerous ones of us have numerous other meetings. We have other responsibilities. I think that'd be very difficult. Yeah, I think that'd be very difficult to get anything done before the end of this week. So it'd have to be next week. And and what does that put with with the the, the budget? Commission. The budget committee also meets uh, June 8th, so we it could be added to the agenda, but that is Monday. Yeah. So. Mr. Sims. I mean, could could this not be 
staff's priority over the next two days? I mean, are, are we so busy that we can't get together for a day or two to to make this happen? If the positions are, are sent, we, we've got a list of the vacant positions. We, we know the positions that are in the district. We know how much they cost. We know how many there are. We can put it together uh, if y'all can make the decisions. And we, if there is a, a Friday night meeting, I'll be here. Mr. Beaver. Okay, thank you. Uh, could we see, is there any open positions at central office? No. I don't believe so, no. Mm -mm. I thought the, the data. Superintendent's open. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, we're data, working on that. Yeah. Data position's cut. That's not open. That's cut. It's gone. Yeah, but it just got cut, and it was open for two years. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I say, do is there any other else that's just laying around? No, ma'am. Or no, sir. No, sir. Sorry, I was looking at Ms. Kinzer. No, sir. Uh, what about Saturday morning? We we passed a budget on a Saturday morning. We, I'm, we, we're either going to have to meet Friday or Saturday. Because, yeah, the one thing to consider is it has to be loaded 24 hours in advance. So if we're going to have a meeting Friday at 6, the only day we have to do the work is tomorrow. That's it. And he has a county commission budget meeting to get ready for. Right. It would have to be Saturday or Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. It would have to be one of those days. Okay. Well, we, we have a motion on the floor, right? The motion is that we accept it with with it, with the one point one eight three two four three in the budget. It, that makes it a face budget, doesn't it? Anyway, no other discussion. Then let's vote. Oh, excuse me, Mr. House. So our job as the board is a budgeting function. But the day-to-day -day operations, personnel issues, who we hire, who we fire, that's not really our decision. We can approve positions. We can, we can defund positions. We can move that money around. That's our prerogative. That's not, the, you know, his. Um, I don't know that we need to know what the plan is, but here's the budget. Here's what we have to work with. Whether that includes hiring a teacher, firing a teacher, moving a central office person, firing a, it, that's not our prerogative. We, we have, we don't have a say in that. Here's the budget. Here's what we have the money for. Here's where we put our money in this, this account, this account, this account. Let's make it work. So I, although I love to see the proposal, I don't know that really it, it's, it doesn't matter. That's not our decision. Daily personnel is not our decision. If they were to bring a document back and say we're going to lose an English teacher here and this one here and this one here and this one here, are we going to nitpick each of those or are we going to say, oh, okay, that's what we asked you to do? Uh, I think that I think that if that's what they have to do and if that's the way the budget is, it's, I don't know that I have to know the nitty gritty about it. Do I want to? Yeah, I do. I, I really do. I don't want any positions cut, and I definitely don't want any benefits. But I do know that we need to pass a budget. We need to move on because they, there's a freeze apparently because it's necessary because now we we're looking at cutting, and and I want that to be taken off as Ms. Parker said. People are looking for jobs right now. We need to, to get the best of the best to come to this county. Uh, that's all I say. Who is next? Miss. Uh, I got a real quick question. Doug, are there any special call budget meetings on the county side f other than just what they've regularly scheduled? Uh, tomorrow and then Monday is the regular. So we, no we could get a new special uh, after the uh, the 8th. We so could the world's not going to end if we don't get this done by Monday. No. Miss Kinzer, to go with that, I mean, I, 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 and I do not plan to start picking it apart. I, I simply would like to have what we had asked for within those numbers, and I would like a starting document so that as we start to make the adjustments throughout the year, which we're going to do, that I know where we started from. 
and I have that in my hands before I vote on it. And I think that's a that's a reasonable thing as a board member that we should actually have the document in our hands before we approve it. Seeing no lights, and we excuse me, who oh. I didn't see a lot. I, I forgot uh, something at, at the front end. I, Mr. Moore, you had asked uh, previous meetings, what are the consequences for not passing a budget? So I did some research. And um, the private act states that the local education agency will submit a budget to the county commission by May 1st. The, the TCA code says the local education agency will submit a budget within 45 days of the end of the fiscal year, May 15th. June 3rd <laughs> and so I contacted them because I've been asked a few times what are the consequences and they said well they're elected officials they should want to follow the law and uh, I, I sat there and I was like okay but what are the consequences to not following that law well they I don't know and so that that's where I'm at <laughs> Miss Kinzer yes. and if we don't have a budget by a certain time it reverts back to maintenance of effort. So we're going to get 103, 994, 821 anyway. August 31st. Seeing no lights, and we're ready to vote. The motion is to accept 103, 994, 821, the maintenance of effort figure that will include an addition or not additional will include one million one eighty three two forty three for textbooks miss shirley can you put four textbooks at the end oh people are already voting <laughs> okay I've knocked this, this off, Shirley, so I can't see anything. Oh, there it is. Ms. Hopkins and Ms. Marinci need to vote. Ms. Marinci votes yes. Ms. Hopkins votes yes. That motion passes. Ms. Kinzer, if I, if I could ask, uh, how soon can we actually have a copy of this budget we just approved without looking at? I, I can send it out probably. To, I've got to send it to the commission, so tomorrow. Okay, if you could yeah. also send that to the board at the same time. Yeah, I'm happy to. If there's no other business, business this meeting's adjourned. Right. Yes, no. We oh, we do have other business. No, let's don't, please. Yeah, I think we've done it. What are you talking about? I'm going. Yeah, see, you're making.